Oh, well, hello everyone around the world. I'd like to welcome you to this IPA webinar on the subject of neutralities. I'm Jack Drescher. I'm a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist in New York, and I will be moderating today's webinar <clears throat> on the subject of neutrality. It's been one of the most relevant theoretical and technical values in the history of psychoanalysis, but influential psychoanalysts have been both its supporters and many have been detractors. In this webinar, three colleagues, will comment on how neutrality acts in emergencies, its role in transference and counter-transference, and the community aspects of psychoanalytic work. I would further add that one of our speakers is having trouble logging in, but we hope she'll be there here you know, when it's time for her to speak. But before I hand over the presentation to our three panelists, I'm going to explain the format of how this webinar is going to work. It will have two sections. In the first section, each of the panelists will give a seven to 10 minute presentation. After the three presentations, the panelists will have some time to interact with each other. The second section is a question and answer portion devoted to the free exchange of selected questions and ideas with the panelists and attendees. You in the audience will find a question box on the right side of your screen. If you would like to ask a question, please write it in this box. And you can post your question at any time during the webinar, even before we start, but your questions will not be addressed or answered until all three presentations from the panelists have been completed. <clears throat> With that in mind, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Hanna Salam Abdel Malik from Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, and the title of her talk is The Impact of Shared Trauma on the Psychoanalytic Frame. Uh, Hanna, Abdul, uh, Hannah Salam Abdul Malak is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst. She's a member of the Paris Psychoanalytic Society and the IPA. She works in private practice in Beirut and specializes in couple, family, and group psychoanalysis. She has also received training in law, negotiations, and mediation, and she's interested in the application of psychoanalysis to the field of international dialogue, conflict transformation, and peacemaking. In 2009, she was runner-up for the Tyson Prize for her article on depression, the rebellion of the real self. And in 2021, she was jointly awarded the Rosica Parker Prize uh, for another article, uh, working through apocalyptic times when the psychoanalytic frame is blown up. And Hannah, turn to you. Thank you very much for the invite. I would like to elaborate today on the impact of Lebanon's socioeconomic crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the Beirut port explosion on my work as a psychoanalyst in Lebanon. These shared traumas affected the psychoanalytic setting, frame, and process. They also impacted my internal analytic framework and compromised my neutrality. Since 2019, Lebanon has been experiencing a severe socioeconomic crisis described by the World Bank as one of the deepest depressions in modern history. The Lebanese pound has lost about 90% of its value and the country is running out of foreign currency, fuel, medicine, electricity, and water. To compound matters, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic in March, 2020. And on 4 August of that same year, a large quantity of ammonium nitrate stored at Beirut port exploded. The blast was among history's most potent artificial non-nuclear explosions. With the economic crisis, most patients could no longer pay my fees. I did not neglect their social reality to, pri to privilege their psychic one. Lest they imagine, as Puget argued, that their social reality and the worries it arouses are not part of the analytic work, that this reality is strange to them or is their own creation and should only be analyzed as such. Thus, I negotiated sessions of frequency, fees, and payment modalities. I renounced pegging my fees to the US dollar, which was, and still is, common practice in Lebanon. In adjusting my fees, I had to feel remunerated to avoid unconsciously favoring my counter-transferential hatred. I also tried to avoid colluding, narcissistically seducing my patients or triggering their unconscious guilt, which would pervert and block the analytic process. However, 
Despite the adjustment, my fees in Lebanese pounds lost three quarters of their value, while my patients' fees quadrupled. I eventually had to repeg my fees to the US dollar. Moreover, during the 2021 psychoanalytic summer break, the severe electricity blackouts and fuel shortage in Lebanon made me postpone my return to the country. I felt guilty for acting omnipotently and decided to respect the planned resumption date for sessions by working remotely. I wanted to preserve a continuity in discontinuity and testify to a presence in absence, despite the absence in presence, which would allow patients, according to Winnicott, and I quote, to experience separation without separation, end of quote. The change in the spatial setting as evident through the computer screen and my unforeseen absence aroused archaic anxieties, death and murder fantasies, primal scene voyeurism, envy and disavowal of our psychoanalytic dissymmetry, as well as transformation in patients. To complicate matters, the COVID-19 pandemic enforced social distancing and mask wearing. My patients and I temporarily distanced ourselves from the psychoanalytic work, focusing more on our shared external reality. The analytic free association, free floating attention, and neutrality were metaphorically muffled. When patients got vaccinated, they asked to take their masks off, which I agreed to. In so doing, I violated abstinence, as I implicitly disclosed my safety from COVID. Additionally, in requesting to take their masks off, patients were seemingly trying to retrieve a psychoanalytic frame unencumbered by the pandemic's constraints. They were also testing the security of our psychoanalytic encounter before metaphorically taking their masks off. Then the explosion at Beirut port destroyed my office. I started working from home, first remotely, as COVID lockdown temporarily abolished in-person work then in person after the lockdown was lifted. The blast shattered the psychoanalytic settings spatial parameter and imposed another violation of the rule of abstinence. I implicitly seduced my patients. They learned something about my private life. They were coming home. At home, patients looked for objects that had survived the destruction of my office. They apparently felt unsure about my psychic survival, that is, about my presence as an animate object. The inanimate objects apparently contained the insecurity triggered by the fracture in the analytic setting and provided a sense of continuity. Moreover, using cyberspace to avoid analytic interruptions may have transformed the inanimate object of the computer screen into a skin draft that helped patients construct a sense of self. It also offered them a space that seemingly compensated for my demolished office. The recently shared traumas recalled Lebanon's multiple wars. They also triggered, according to Jana, topical collapse, blurring the boundaries between psychic and physical realities, fantasy and events, the internal and the external. They revived the infantile, as Guignard put it, in both my patients and me. I was unable to efficiently offer my patients my thought thinking apparatus to help them, as Bion argued, decontaminate, transform, and assimilate their traumatic experiences. At times, I could not reliably discern my counter transference to distinguish my patients' anxieties and defenses from mine. At other times, I shared my patients' narcissistic withdrawal. I felt disengaged during sessions. I lost, according to Green, my benevolent neutrality of understanding receptivity, availability, and equanimity towards my patients and their unconscious productions, as well as mine. My patients started soliciting me to respond concretely to their anxieties, as if trying to reanimate me. Listening to their litanies, I intervened more frequently, 
putting at risk the fundamental rule. I focused on external reality, mirroring my patient's operational mode of functioning and compromising my free-floating attention. I unconsciously wanted to offer them and me a psychic prosthesis. The loss of my office had revived my earlier experiences of traumatic absences. My internal framework was tested and with it, my ability to contain and work through my patient's experiences of absence. I felt like Green's dead mother, present physically but emotionally detached. In the face of shock and fright and in an effort, in an unconscious effort to cope, I split off. On the one hand, regressing, losing my psychoanalytic neutrality, and on the other hand, be behaving like Ferenzi's wise baby. I was offering patients psychoanalytic theory snippets, which to Guignard were pseudo-associations or blocking interpretations. I had to do my personal trauma work as the assayos suggested. I contained my anguish of the uncertainty triggered by the traumatic events and the revival of my infantile traumas. Whenever I felt overwhelmed by anxiety about the future, I reminded myself of Winnicott's aphorism that what one fears will happen has already happened. This anchored me in the present and brought me back to the psychoanalytic stance of neutrality, free floating attention and suspension of memory and desire. I refocused on the impact of the shared traumatic events on my patient's psychic functioning rather than on the events per se. In conclusion, the frames containing function depends, according to Goldberg, not on ground rules, setting, or technique, but on the unconscious ability to use another person's mind. However, when shared traumas jeopardize the analyst's internal framework, then the analyst's logic of hope becomes paramount. My life drive pacified my patients. They could trust me and identify with my good internal objects, which seemed enough to continue the analytic process while I regain my internal framework and neutrality. The psychoanalyst's enactments that result from shared trauma are not, according to Mitchell, pathological manifestations, but an inherent part of the therapeutic field that can inform the therapeutic process. What the analyst does is not important as long as they self-reflect, respect their patient's interests, and struggle to do what they think is right. Elaborating on both their patients' enactments and their own helps analysts safeguard their internal framework and preserve the analyzing situation, which facilitates, according to Donnay, the analytic diet's capacity to self-organize, disorganize, and reorganize. Although neutrality is an imperative, it remains, as Godfriend argued, a permanent conquest for the analyst vacillating with their counter-transference. The tranquility of the analyst's neutral state of mind is an illusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, our, hold on. Where am I? <laughs> I? My computer's acting up a little bit. One moment. OK. So uh, our next speaker is Patricia Olguin from Chile, who is going to give a talk uh, entitled Neutrality as a Refuge, What Are We Afraid of? Uh, uh, Patricia is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst in training. He studied psychology at Pontific Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and is currently a candidate at the Chilean Psychoanalytical Association. She lives in Santiago and has worked for 20 years with adults and adolescents in private practice and private and public health organizations. She was also trained as a psychoanalytical psychotherapist in short-term psychotherapy. Patricia, you're up next. Thank you, Jack. Um, well, the topic that brings us together today has undoubtedly generated many controversies in the history of psychoanalysis. 
Perhaps the first of these is that the word neutrality was never used by Freud explicitly. It was Strachey who translated the German word indifference as neutrality in the English version of the classic 1914 article, Observations on Transference Love. It is interesting to consider that Freud is talking in this paper to beginner analysts. As a matter of fact, at that time, most analysts were beginners and warns them about the danger of this method, even making a comparison with the work of a chemist. In his own words, quote, the psychoanalyst knows that he's working with highly explosive forces and that he needs to proceed with as much caution and conscientiousness as a chemist, end of quote. As a candidate, I am also a beginner, and it is from this point of view that I would like to discuss the issue of neutrality. According to Laplanche and Pontalis, neutrality is one of the qualities that define the analyst's attitude during treatment. The analyst must be neutral in terms of religious, moral, and social values, refraining from making judgments and giving advice. He or she must also be neutral regarding the transference which implies not entering into the patient's game and must also be neutral regarding to the patient's discourse, that is not granting greater importance to a certain fragment due to theoretical or any other kind of prejudices. This definition seems clear and simple, but is it really that simple? Can we be neutral or indifferent when we work in psychoanalysis? Freud considered that the counter-transference should be stifled. In the same article cited above, he points out, quote, in my opinion, therefore, we are not to give up the neutrality or indifference towards the patient, which we have acquired through keeping in the counter-transference in check, end of quote. At that time, counter-transference was considered an obstacle and represented the analyst pathology thus requiring supervision and analysis to be suffocated. From Klein and the introduction of the object relations theory onward, that vision changed. Klein introduced the notion of transference as a total situation, and then Winnicott wrote hate in the counter-transference, telling us that the analyst's feelings and reactions towards his patient were an important source of information because through the mechanisms of projection and protective identification, the analysis earliest relationships and conflicts were recreated in the transfer. Probably Freud's initial idea of stifling counter-transference is linked to this ideal of neutrality, and in my opinion, responds to the intensity of the feelings that arise when being in a relationship as intimate and close as the one between analyst and patient. It is this intensity, which most of the times can be difficult to contain, that may lead us to take refuge in a supposed neutrality that can be misunderstood as affective distance and that could eventually interfere in the development of the analytic process. Paula Heyman, in her remarkable article on counter-transference in 1949, warned, quote, I have been struck by the widespread belief among candidates that the counter transfers is nothing but a source of trouble. Many candidates are afraid and feel guilty when they become aware of feelings towards their patients and consequently aim at avoiding any emotional response and at becoming completely unfeeling and detached." End of quote. Heyman argues that this notion probably derives from misunderstanding Freud's comparison with the work of a surgeon or with the signal that the analyst should be like the surface of a mirror reflecting only the patient. In her opinion, the analyst's emotional response to the patient during the analytic session is one of the most important tools of analytic work and the counter transference becomes an instrument to investigate the patient's unconscious. Today, most analysts agree that the counter-transference is essential to be able to carry out an analysis. 
Even though for all analysts, the intimate bond with a patient requires working hard, the process of training as a psychoanalyst is demanding not only from the point of view of the amount of work, but also because of the emotional burden involved in being in theoretical seminars, supervising control cases, and in analysis, all at the same time. We could describe it as a true emotional storm that many times can lead us to hide in a supposed neutrality, understood as emotional distance, which beyond of being useful for the patient, can serve us candidates to protect us from those feelings that are more difficult for us to accept. Perhaps it is no coincidence that the controversy in the translation of indifference as neutrality occurs in the article of transference law. Probably one of the most intense and difficult situations to handle in an analysis, especially for beginners. Regarding transference love, the concept of abstinence becomes also relevant. There, Freud argues that deprivation leads desire to unfold and the unconscious to emerge. I will take the definition that Laplanche and Pontalis make of the principle of abstinence which alludes to the fact that the analytic cure must be directed in such a way that the patient finds the minimum possible substitute satisfactions for his symptoms, while the analyst must not satisfy the demands of the patient, nor play the roles that the patient tends to impose on him. The emphasis, therefore, is on the act of interpreting the conflict instead of satisfying the instinctual demands of the analysant. In an article titled Neutrality or Abstinence, Kolnick in 1999 argues, quote, we could consider that the rule of abstinence constitutes a fundamental piece to give this form of encounter that occurs in analysis, certain peculiarities that make an important difference with any other type of relationship. It is not about conceiving a bond that is characterized by affective coldness, or a rigid or inflexible attitude on part of the analyst, but neither it can be configured as a social relationship whose lack of limit would endanger the development of the analytic process itself." End of quote. It seems to me that neutrality can often be misunderstood as the so-called poker face, which rather than stimulating the patient's free association, inhibits the emotional expression of some conflicts. Related to the above, neutrality could also be seen as a way of not getting involved in the relationship with the analysant and keeping a distance when we don't know what to do with the conflicts that unfold both in the patient and in ourselves. I believe that the theory of the analytic field introduced by the Barangers in 1961 is useful to understand what happens that what happens in session does not happen only to the patient or to the analyst. In their words, quote, the analytic situation must be formulated not as a situation of a person facing an indefinite and neutral character at the end of a person facing himself, but as a situation of two people inevitably linked and complementary while the situation is lasting and involved in the same dynamic process. Neither member of this pair is intelligible within the situation without the other." End of quote. These authors also affirm that there must be a lack of definition or ambiguity, which makes it possible for every element or event within the field to be something else at the same time. This is why the analyst must eliminate references to his objective personality as much as possible and leave it in the greatest degree of indefiniteness. From this point of view, this is what makes possible the as if and the analytical process to develop. I think that from this perspective, neutrality would be closer to ambiguity and abstinence could be a way of sustaining this lack of definition to the extent that the analyst does not act, but interprets what is happening in the field. When we think of neutrality in terms of ambiguity, it may help us to broaden our perspective 
and our work within the analytic field. The concept of abstinence assumes that there is a desire that must be contained. In my opinion, analytical work takes place in the field of desire, and that is what makes it such a demanding and, exact, and exciting job. In order to be able to abstain, I must first recognize the desire, and that is something that requires the analyst to have a deep knowledge of himself. Therefore, our personal analysis becomes essential to be able to carry out the work with our patients, especially in the training stage. Regarding training analysis, I would like to briefly mention some ideas that came to my mind while I was preparing this presentation. I am a candidate from a small association where it is usual for the training analyst to be also a teacher and to participate in other activities at the Institute. How is ambiguity and neutrality maintained in the analytic session when the analyst has different roles? How to maintain the as if when a relationship is inevitably established outside the analytic session? It seems to me that neutrality is always at risk in a training analysis, and that both analyst and candidate must make a greater effort to be able to maintain the as if that allows the development of the analytic process. Finally, through personal analysis and supervision, I have been able to understand better which are my patients' conflicts where I tend to hide or the ones in which I tend to be particularly distant precisely because they are very close and dangerous to me, as the explosive forces which Freud talks about. If we understand neutrality as an indefinition that allows us to think within the analytic field, it can become a concept that may guide us. It can work as a compass, favoring an analytical attitude that allows us to maintain a free-floating attention and a receptive analytical listening minimizing personal and theoretical prejudices and refraining from saturating the analytic field with our own unresolved conflicts. After all, maybe neutrality may help us to be less afraid of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, uh, I'm happy to say that our final speaker has made it in. Jane, welcome. Um, <clears throat> You're going to be unmuted shortly. So Jane Hassinger uh, is in uh, the USA in Michigan. Uh, the title of her talk is "There's No Such Thing as Neutral: Getting in Ge Getting in Gear for Psychoanalytic Community-Based Practice." Uh, Jane is a psychoanalyst in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and a retired faculty member in the Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Michigan, my medical school alma mater, by the way. She's a member of the Michigan Psychoanalytic Society and on the faculty of the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California's Group Process Program. Her interdisciplinary projects have addressed significant global challenges such as abortion, gender-based violence, and mental health, and include Global Provider Share Program, um, Community Responses for Survivors of Gender Violence in the DRC, and Women on Purpose, Ending Silence Around HIV AIDS, and many more things. Jane. I turn the microphone, well, Matthew will turn the microphone over to you. Thank you. We don't, we don't hear you. It says I'm unmuted. Ah, okay, we hear you now. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. I'm sorry for these technical difficulties. I'm not in Michigan, actually. I'm in a rented apartment in Philadelphia where my husband is in the hospital. So I'm in a frantic situation. I'm glad you've helped me um, resolve this part of it. Um, first, a disclaimer. I've been a dedicated psychoanalytic practitioner for the better part of four decades, and most of the time firmly convinced of the impossibility of neutrality. Even the undesirability of adopting such a stance. Since my early education as a group worker and later as a psychotherapist, psychoanalytic approaches to child development, psychopathologies, parent guidance, and treatment were dominant. But it mattered greatly that I 
began my career as a group worker when I was very fortunate to participate in a program at the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research, inspired by Tavascott graduates and other refugee social scientists who brought their research in group dynamics and conflict res resolution to the United States. Although I could not have articulated this at the time, my exposure to working in groups opened the gate through which one moves inevitably from a one-person psychology of mine to the relational and intersubjective. The concept of neutrality, although still promoted as the ideal for practitioners, has been dealt a fatal blow. I never fully emotionally accepted the primacy of authority relations with the implicit view that all departures for working in peer relations represent pathological adaptations to resolving problems in groups. But like so many of us, I did participate in what our colleague Anton Hart has recently referred to as the white lie of neutrality. White lie, what an evocative, compact summary of the ways in which our practices continue to contain certain essentialist views of the mind and cemented in dynamics of white supremacist authoritarian colonial rule. My eventual analytic training in contemporary evolving models of relational and intersubjective psychoanalysis have helped me recover from this delusion and others. It's a work in progress. Throughout my career, my passion for bringing psychoanalytic insights and tools to the challenges of solving community problems, in addition to work as a psychoanalyst with individuals, has fueled many wonderful interdisciplinary and often international projects, often focused on women's reproductive health care and sexually based violence. These experiences have provided me with my most profound and generative education. Often, I longed for opportunities to share with other psychoanalytic practitioners working in similar arenas. I wanted to avoid what felt like a patronizing and dismissive response from psychoanalytic colleagues reflecting the second-class citizen status of what had generally been regarded as applied psychoanalysis. In 2013, after returning from a, a long stay in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I was working with Dr. Dennis Mukwege, you may know, who's a recent Nobel laureate, um, at his hospital, Ponzi Hospital, with an international team of folks working on creating mental health interventions for the appalling number of victims of sexual violence as a a, a tool of warfare in that region. Um, I'd come home and I went to a conference uh, at the organization called Psychoanalysis Culture and Society at Rutgers University, where I was fortunate to hear Billy Pivnik speak with her colleagues about their ongoing work in the design process of the 9-11 Museum in New York City. At that meeting, we knew that uh, we, meaning Billy and I, that we had discovered a soulmate in each other. In 2014, we founded the Psychoanalytic Community Collaboratory. The Collaboratory is a web-based seminar, project incubator, and experiential laboratory in which participants share stories from their work, explore relevant interdisciplinary scholarship, and collaborate on the development of new projects as well as learn from sharing leadership and collaborator roles. Opportunities quite absent, I'm sure uh, we all know, from most psychoanalytic training programs. Through six iterations, the collaboratory has become a generator of such creative collab collaborations as documentary films, community memorial projects, and mental health interventions in highly stressed communities. With the inclusion of a reflective group methodology that emphasizes the intersubjective dimensions of communication, the collaboratory has also offered a site for studying complex intersubjective dynamics as they play out in group and community life. In summary, here are a few closing thoughts for discussion. 
One, working in groups makes evident that the concept of neutrality is based on, I believe, a privileged myth of authority relations and not grounded in empirical data and accumulated experience across time and cultures. Two, as Shapiro and Carr, among others, have demonstrated, rigid adherence to the demands of this myth creates I -O -I -O sorry, I atrogenic pathological outcomes and views of sibling and peer relations that has impoverished our developmental theories and view of leadership roles as a critical piece of maturation and adult development. Tavistock's omniscient leader model appears to me to elicit dysfunction in peer relations that can then be studied. Three, Flamic Volkan's chosen trauma model is in a way preferable in as much as it exposes reified, distorted myths associated with group historical trauma that make healthy communication, choice, coexistence, and negotiation difficult, if not impossible. Neutrality on an intercultural, international level means only that the group refuses to take action in response to extreme ethical and moral pressures to do so, albeit with thoughtful, careful self-analysis in place and a commitment to what Anton Hart has referred to as radical honesty. Four, a better approach might be found in our application of working in the group in the psychoanalytic community collaboratory in which we attempt to facilitate reflective processes that privilege an emphasis on sharing origin stories that help members understand how their attitudes and feelings generated in the group are historically and socially constructed. In this work, leaders and members are more able to respond to differences and conflicts among members and negotiate group splits and impasses with greater nuance, flexibility, and maturity. A recent article in, um, in the IPA um, addresses several vi vignettes that illustrate this, this process. So I'd like to end at this point, and I thank you for your attention and your patience and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Jane. Um, I think all of our speakers are now unmuted. And so this is, uh, before we turn to questions and comments from our audience, uh, we have over 150 people who are listening in right now. So that makes you anxious, good. Um, so. <laughs> So thank you, thank you all for the, those, those talks. Um, I, I, of course, I have many opinions about the subject of neutrality, but I'd like to, to have the three of you perhaps, you know, comment uh, on each other's talks. Jane, even though you weren't on the uh, on the screen, you were listening, I know, right, to uh, to the other speakers from the audience, correct? Eventually, I was. Yes, I missed yeah, some of Hunter. Okay. Hunt. okay. Well, I'll start then anyway. How's that? So, and get us going. So, you know, Hannah, when I was listening to your talk, uh, although the, the comparison is not exactly the same, you know, I was reminded of what happened to us here in New York on September 11th, 2001, where uh, some, for some reason people had the belief that we therapists were somehow better at coping with acts of terrorism than our patients. This, this, is, a, this is part of the fantasy of neutrality which is that somehow we were immune and that we were going to somehow be in better shape to deal with the trauma that we all experience. And I, th and I think that's a terrible burden on therapists to believe that somehow, you know, we are better suited than the people we work with to deal with the stresses of the world, particularly when the world is falling apart around us. So I, I was very, of course, very moved by what you went through and what you had to deal with with the patients. So. Through our training, we are we have tools that have something wrong with the sound.
I was saying, maybe with the training we have and the experiences we have, we have the tools that can help us. That doesn't mean that we are immune. We need to completely work through. So, so I think may, maybe technically, if we have everybody sound on at the same time, it may be difficult to hear the speaker. So maybe we can, Matthew, I know, uh, mute and unmute as necessarily, as necessary. Just, and, and you can raise your hand and I'll call on you to speak. Patricia, any thoughts on the other yeah. talks that you heard? Yeah. When I when I was listening to Hannah's presentation, I was like overwhelmed in some way with all the things that you have been through working with patients and with all the reality that like the like the burden of reality sometimes. And it was like uh, I, I immediately recall like well psychoanalysis was born in a uh, in between wars, you know, like I was remembering the there uh, that Klein was working when bombs were like hitting London and well it was it is somehow a little bit crazy to still be working when everything is falling apart but still and I can talk also about my experience I I am in I was in the middle of my training uh, stage when the pandemic started so I was immediately faced to be working in in long distance in my personal analysis and with my patients and I was thinking that the ability to, what you say, Hannah, keeping like the internal frame, that is what keeps us from falling apart with our patients. So what, what Jack said about being well, like best prepared, I don't know if we are best prepared. I think that we have still keep on thinking. And that's so hard to keep on thinking when everything is falling apart and when others don't want to think, they want to just escape or are afraid or are sad are scared and we like as analysts have to keep on thinking even though we also don't know what's going to happen and i think that's everything about keeping the uncertain in ourselves and that's like one of the most typical things of being an analyst, an analyst in my opinion like being able to tolerate the uncertainty yeah in, in fact we could say that regardless of even in, the, in in everyday situations, we try to help patients in psychoanalysis tolerate what's called the anxiety of uncertainty. So that, so that, that is, so I think, uh, I think the, your, the point you and, and Hannah make is correct, that, you know, that we have a tool. It may not be the perfect tool, but it is a tool that might be helpful to ourselves and to our patients. Any other thoughts about each other's talks? If not, I'm happy to open up the uh, the, the, uh, the room to questions. Uh, Jane, you have something? Go ahead. You have to unmute. I don't hear, we don't hear you. There you go. How about now? How about now? Okay, good, sorry. Um, I appreciate both of your, your comments and at least through them is, a, is an important focus on the struggles to maintain empathy through throughout. Our, our work, um, and I would say empathy for both our patients or the groups with with which we work, but also for ourselves. Um, and that means that we also understand that we never are perfect at this work, and that we need multiple sources of support and of learning, including from the patient. Um, I like to think about what uh, Donald Stern has has written about. Uh, when he uses the expression courting surprise, the openness to being, to, to moving into the unknown and learning from, uh, from our patients in ways that are often unexpected. 
I think that this, uh, the likelihood that this happens best comes from a real conscious commitment to being learners ourselves always. Um, and learners in, in, a, uh, in the relationship with our patients um, as well as, uh, as functioning as their uh, analysts. Uh, with all the expertise that comes with that. That's a matter of attitude, I think, and it's an attitude that takes a long time to cultivate um, and to to uh, live inside of deeply. Thank maybe, you, Jane. Uh, Beth, Hannah. Maybe uh, to go back to uh, a client who was working under bombs, there has been a long trajectory from client to the present with, for example, Janine Puget, because a client was criticized, she uh, overemphasized the, in, the fantasies over reality, so she underplayed that. And then, and then Janine Puget, who uh, argued that we do have to work through the external reality so that afterwards we can work through the fantasies that are generated by this external reality. Now, another thing about neutrality, I have a tendency to prefer to think in terms of the internal framework which encompasses neutrality. So it, it's an ensemble, it's not only neutrality, it's a way of being and thinking and listening and it includes a third position of an observer, and sometimes we lose that. So it's openness to experience, openness to the unknown, uh, tolerance to frustration. It's the ability to play inside, internally to play and have the freedom to play. And then when that, when that is compromised, because even that is compromised, like for example, Pearson talked about the internal setting and he talked about how this internal setting can be attacked. The, the, by, I mean, the, the external setting can be uh, attacked. The external setting or framework can be attacked either from the outside or from the inside, but the internal setting should be maintained. What, what I would like to argue is that even that internal framework is not a given. It needs constant work. That can as well be attacked. We can lose that momentarily, hopefully. Otherwise, we're in, in a very serious situation. But we need to have that third observer who can bring us back to that analytic listening and positioning and, and, and way of being. It, it's a continuous work. Yes, but you know, so I, I, I was thinking about the, 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 the subject of how sometimes the analyst has to say to the patient, you know, I'm overwhelmed today by circumstances, and I may not be of any use to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, 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 that in essence, it, it's also important that there be the capacity, because the neutrality is part of the blank screen model. You know, and the blank screen model is problematic because it, it creates the false illusion, you know, that the analyst is not subject to the same traumas as, as the patient. <laughs> Which was going back to the work of therapy, for example. So there has to be a way within clinical practice under extraordinary circumstances for it to be okay, you know, for the analyst to say, look, maybe we should reschedule this for tomorrow, you know, or, or, or later in the day, because today is not a good moment for me. Jane? Agreed. Okay. It's very right. analytic anyway. It's very analytic because it shows the patient that the, the analyst is not omnipotent. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, about what you said, Jack, I was thinking that, again, from my point of view as a candidate, that it's so hard to recognize that, you know, because we try to think that we are prepared and we have to still be working. So we don't have to be overwhelmed or we don't have to reschedule because it takes a lot of courage to recognize that we are overwhelmed, for example, or that we cannot work that day. And, and that's why I thought of neutrality as a refuge when we are beginners, because it can serve as a way of hiding, of not being in touch with ourselves and with the patient, because sometimes it can be too hard. It can be too close. So yeah, I think that's part of the experience to be capable of recognizing when we are not able to continue working, for example. For a certain situation. 
Jane, could you unmute? I mean, could you mute? Because you have background noise there, wherever you are. Um, but the next, so I do have a question. One question has come in for Jane. Uh, it says, thank you for sharing these presentations. I'm interested in hearing Jane tell us more about the collaboratory and reflective group experience, how these have contributed to her work with individual patients and neutrality or vice versa. How has her psychoanalytic training helped in how she listens in a group experience? Oh, I really appreciate that question. Um, yes, I, I find that the, uh, the learning goes back and forth from the clinical setting to the group setting, uh, on and on and on. Um, one thing that ha has happened in the six years that Billy and I have been running the collaboratory is we have learned a, a few really important lessons about multiplicity and the multiple identities that each person carries, most of which are, are rooted in contemporary adult life, but also um, early life that, uh, that have to do with culture. And those rarely come up in very explicit ways uh, for uh, patients in psychotherapy, at least for those in the United States, for example, who identify with kind of predominant myth about whiteness, for example, um, and uh, the melting pot ideology of the United States. Um, those identities are often submerged, and if the uh, identity of the therapist is uh, the same roughly as the patient, those identities often, and those histories often remain submerged. Um, but when we're in group, where there are more people, more contributors with, mul with multiple different uh, identities and histories are more likely to be evinced um, and become part of the subject matter. Um, what that has done for me with my individual patients is remind me of what I'm not asking about, what I'm not listening for, what I'm not inquiring about. Um, another another thing that's that's appeared uh, very very important in our experiences in the collaboratory has to do with leadership. You know, most of our developmental theories end at adolescence in, <laughs> in uh, psychoanalysis, as though no growth happens after that that has any, any significance to the therapeutic endeavor. Um, what we learn when we go out into the world is that we're all challenged in so many different ways um, in our, uh, uh, our ability to become members of communities, members of society. Uh, participating uh, participants in the political and cultural and social lives of our communities and those those areas are, are crucibles for much much conflict and much development uh, what we don't focus on is how people learn um, to take leadership to assume responsibility in these kinds of settings including the responsibility as a citizen um, and so I, I have realized as working in the collaboratory group where these dimensions are terribly important um, that I've overlooked this in my clinical work. I've acted as though those were irrelevant dimensions of people's development. And, um, and I've, I've changed my, my practice um, given, given that focus. Those opportunities to assume leadership to, to uh, practice, for example, in the collaboratory group itself, taking on leadership, uh, taking on roles of teaching, uh, help people come to understand that the role is flexible and the, and the role of leadership is something that we move in and out of all the time, that it's not a fixed, uh, reified role, it's not related to authority necessarily, although it can be, but it is very much related to the effectiveness of groups and the effectiveness of how we enact our citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question which can be addressed by all of the panelists, uh, which is what elements do you think influence neutrality 
that made it so important in the history of psychoanalysis and maybe even in the present. I, I would add that. I I was thinking that maybe it has to do with abstinence, you know, like neutrality, very close to the to the principle of not acting with the patient, but keep on interpreting. And and while I was preparing this presentation, I was like very uh, interested in this idea that this uh, mistake in translating the word that, by the way, only happened in the English version. Because we who I read the Spanish version that was translated by uh, another analyst, not, not Strachi, it, it was correct. He translated indifference by indiferencia in Spanish. So this like controversy is only in English. And and I I searched research a little bit and it has to do with the war that was going on while Strachi was translating there. And uh, neutrality was like a diplomatic uh, word you know like diplomatic attitude that then was taken by the French like the benevolent neutrality that then Green talked about but I was thinking that it has to do with not acting you know like being neutral like in a way of being able to interpret but not act in the transference and I think it, it has something to do with that but in my opinion it is more like maintaining the ambiguity more because we are not neutral we cannot be neutral we, we show everything about ourselves in the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we have our office or decorated or whatever. Today with internet, a patient might know everything about us. They Google us, so there's no such a neutrality nowadays. But I think that the ambiguity, the ability to keep the as if and not saturating the field with ourselves is what makes an analytic relationship different from any other relationship. I would like to uh, uh, come back to this idea of as if. It, it, it poses a problem for me. <laughs> because with the as if, there's a kind of falseness to the experience and to the presence of an analyst. We're acting, we're play acting that neutrality. It is an endeavor. It's something we aim for constantly. But is it an as if? It, it brings to mind the, the idea of a false self. But I don't like. Oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I think the as if as the possibility of being anything, like not being saturated in, a, in one place only in the transference, like being able to move around every other kind of position inside the, the relationship with the patient. But yeah, and I understand that maybe the as if sounds like a false self, like in the Winnicott uh, way. But I was meaning the as if in the way of being able to move around and not being positioned in only one place and rigid in one place, for example. I, I really appreciate that clarification, sorry. And uh, that distinction I think is important. And yet the focus on as if, as uh, intended by, by Winnicott is relevant because I think if we have a kind of in unsophisticated understanding of what we mean by neutrality, uh, we're, we're tilted in the direction of play acting. And I think that's, that's not uncommon and uh, particularly maybe for um, lesser experienced practitioners, but not only. And I think that our patients can, can sense that very much. I, I think, and this is something perhaps three of you might, there's a question coming from me, I, I'll take moderator's privilege here, you know, which just has to do with our counter-transferences, really, which is that, you know, I, I've taken the position in my writings that you know, that uh, there is no such thing as the perf perfectly analyzed analyst who doesn't have countertransferences, that the best we can do is to know what our countertransferences are. And that if you're like me, you know, what now in my fourth decade as a clinician, still learning 
you know, that every time you meet a new patient, you might discover a little, another little part of yourself that was not uh, known to you, that, you know, that we have biases and that we, what's helpful is for us to know that we cannot rid ourselves necessarily of all our biases. We just need to know what they are if we're going to be helpful to our patients. I'd be interested in your thoughts about that idea. Yes, and maybe as well with this idea of countertransference and being aware of it, most of our countertransference is, is unconscious. And often it's only afterwards, on après coup, in afterwardness, that we may realize and we may think after the session and how we can work through that to come back next time into session. So also even with the analysis of our countertransference, there's an ideal to, uh, towards it. A lot of times, just we just miss it. We're not aware of it, like our cultural bias. There are certain things that are deep rooted. I would go back here to the infantile that we carry each one of us, and how that impacts our counter transference as well when it is triggered, and we're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. So easier so said than as well. Uh, all right. So one one word I think that might in English. As, as one of the native speakers is aspirational that you know that we we, we aspire to, you know to be you know to know our countertransference to be neutral to be unbiased etc but these to be aspirational is an ideal it's not necessarily mm -hmm. something which is mm -hmm. achievable mm -hmm. patricia you look like you were going to say something no well i can say something i was thinking yeah that the difference from ideal and because we can consider neutrality as an ideal not as a goal in a treatment. So maybe that's also the difference, you know, like it's not a goal, it's something that can guide our work in some way. Like like Hannah told us in her presentation, being able to maintain an internal frame, that's being neutral, not being like away or detached or poker face, you know? I was thinking about that. Okay. I have another question. I, I'm sorry. Somebody has I like when you explained, uh, Patricia, the, the, uh, the ability to move around when you try to clarify the idea of as if. And what came to mind is, I remember one analyst who said, well, neutrality is to position oneself in the middle, neither with a super ego nor with the id. So maybe this is one way of looking at it. I mean, one interpretation, not like inside. Yeah, but like what Anna Freud said about being a two or three, to yeah, and also she said being equidistant. She never used also the word neutral, so that's also interesting. In my research, I also found that out that that she never mm -hmm. said neutrality. She only said equidistant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I think the the term itself um, is a problem because it. It implies um, the absence of any moral judgment, and I don't think that that's feasible or even desirable. And you know, we we might talk, for example, as as um, there are many conversations going on about this now, particularly in the United States, about what the analyst does. Maybe particularly uh, the uh, white analyst when confronted with racist attitudes in their patients. Um, uh, you know, a subject that arguably one cannot remain neutral. And the, uh, the effort to do so, I think, does sort of involve sometimes erecting a kind of false, false self. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder what we think about, about this. Uh, how, 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 I think playing, the, the ability to move around and play and be flexible will help us deal with these moments. But I'm curious to, to hear what you all think about, about that. Well, you know, I just want to say, you know, many, the American Psychoanalytic Association is in the midst of exploring its own relationship to racism as a, as yeah. a field, uh, as are many other organizations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the idea that, you know, w one of the things I think that we're unfortunately saddled with is a history of psychoanal psychoanalysis as a, uh, as a universal theory of the mind, which means that there, that there are no cultural, there wouldn't be cultural differences or cultural differences 
are, are less important than this sort of, you know, um, structural model of the mind and how that works. And of course, you know, many contemporary psychoanalytic practitioners don't believe in that at all, that it's impossible to separate out cultural issues, you know, uh, from that, even though you might find that model of the mind useful, it isn't necessarily universal. There's a famous psychoanalyst who, uh, uh, George Devereux, French and then American, who uh, mixed between psychoanalysis and anthropology and worked on that, the, the impact of culture. And uh, there's a film that was made on one of his major cases about uh, an Indian um, Native, Native American uh, and how he was in, hospitalized and his colleagues thought that he was uh, schizophrenic and then finally he said no, it's about a cultural thing and he worked with him and, and it's the whole trajectory of working with him so I think we're moving, we're rotating around this issue, yeah. I have another question from the audience, how does the notion of neutrality play out in couples therapy settings where triangulation is quote unquote forbidden. And why is triangulation forbidden? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it's that also, applies. <laughs> well, it's too bad because it's unavoidable <laughs> at the moment. All right. Uh, but I, I do know, for example, uh, speaking from an object relations perspective, that it's uh, one of the challenges is to sort of like be a, to try and be sympathetic to everybody's side in whatever argument is going on, whether that's an argument between two people in couples therapy or whether that's an argument between two competing internalized objects or internalized identifications. So. I'm not sure about the triangulation question. Maybe they'll send in a, a, a modifier. Uh, another comment. Thank you for the intervention from the three speakers. I would like to emphasize the importance that we psychoanalysts need to share our thoughts and experiences with our peers to maintain alive a creative field of thought, whatever our theoretical backgrounds. It helps also candidates not only to accept diversity, complexity, and necessitates an active implication. I don't think I don't see any disagreement here, right? No. Okay. Uh, and then another comment. Thank you for this wonderful seminar experience. I might have a beginner's question since I am a candidate myself, but I'm interested in where exactly neutrality stands at in contemporary psychoanalysis. Are we ever truly neutral? That's like a million dollar question. Well, I think I made it clear where I stand on that matter. <laughs> no, I don't think we're ever truly neutral, nor do I find that a desirable objective. Um, I think Hannah has mentioned and Patricia accented the importance of self-awareness uh, and of being kind of in constant conversation with oneself. Um, as uh, countertransference feelings and other kinds of objections emerge. Um, that again, we're playing, we're playing with this internally, flexibly, hopefully, but I don't think that neutrality is ever something we find. I would like to get back to the question mm -hmm. on uh, the neutrality within the couple, because I work with couples. And the way I listen is, I listen to the individual in the couple, I listen to the couple as an entity, and then I listen to the neo group that has been constituted with me in the couple. So the ability to come back to Patricia's explanation of moving around and listening to all these dynamics, all three of them, and, and, and responding to them and, and elaborating on them in, in a back and forth thing. Like when we work in groups, Jane has talked about this. And so maybe the ability to, to juggle in between different positions and not stick to one. And remember that when one 
of the individuals of the couple is speaking, they are speaking in their name and they are speaking in the name of the couple. So there's some, they're saying something for themselves and they're saying something about their couple, even though it may be conflictual. So they're saying, we're having difficulty separating or we're having difficulty communicating or, or whatever, so, or we're traumatized. So even if one says this, then it's the couple that is suffering from it. I have a very provocative question here, which is why should finding racist attitudes in a patient challenge neutrality and not make it more desirable? Wouldn't it be enough to analyze racism in the patient, restraining from influencing the patient with the analyst values? I don't think it's sometimes enough. Sometimes it is enough. Um, and that depends on the, on the person, the state of the analysis the stage of the analysis, all sorts of things. But I think it's not always enough. What do you, what do you all think? I have a tendency to hear racism as an expression of something else. Maybe rejection, um, maybe uh, feelings of inferiority, shame that are expressed under the heading of racism. And so what would the analyst do then? Would we uh, act as if we've heard nothing and uh, work in denial? Or do we highlight it and focus on it as, as such and take it as a, I mean, focus on, on it as a symptom rather than look at it and at, at what is behind it? So I have a tendency to see it as another manifestation of unconscious dynamics. Family dynamics, group dynamics, for the individual, uh, infantile dynamics, they are saying something. So why not address it? Of course, there's the issue of uh, the, 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 the moral value of being correct. And so we are into the ethical dynamics. And if that is brought up, how does the analyst deal with that? And the way they deal with that also reflects their thinking and their analysis and their way of, of conducting analysis. Do we take it as, 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 a, as an ethical issue? It all depends on how we deal with it. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Hanan. I was thinking that maybe if we think uh, more about other phenomena, like things like, like politics, for example, for example, now in my country, we are in a very difficult political situation because we are do, having a new constitution and we will have to vote if we agree or disagree this new constitution. And it all polarized, you know, in the ones that are in favor or against. So I was also thinking racism as a manifestation in this case of, of thinking in a binary way, you know, like the good or the bad, um, good or wrong in some way. And I think that's like the most anti-analytics thinking, you know, like trying to have two alternatives, good or bad. So I was thinking that maybe if we take that into the internal world, like trying to understand what object it represents or what happens inside, it's easier because if not, we stay in the reality that can be very polarized, you know, the good, the bad, the black, white, uh, good, wrong. Um, and I think that that doesn't help us think or neither help the patient, you know help to think because this is about opening like trying to think more about what's happening not closing not finding an answer yeah i can share with you my experience as a woman in lebanon lebanon has specific particularities in the sense that we are a confessional community and the whole political system is a confessional system and it creates a lot of problems and we've been suffering for years and decades now uh, is patients often want to know my confessional background. And in that, they try to, I, the way I hear it is they're trying to see whether I will accept them. I can see from their vantage point, will I be rejecting them? 
do we have common grounds what are the common grounds often they may be rejecting of me so but that's part of the field and it's part of the work and it's material to work on mm. now in general terms you can call it racism it's confessionalism it's one very specific aspect so it's your socioeconomic background it's your religious background it's 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 all of that and we live in it constantly I, I might further, I, I was struck by the question, you know, I think racism means different things in different cultures. You know, what, what, when we're talking about racism in the United States, we're really talking about our history of slavery, you know, and the aftermath of our civil war and all the reconstruction and Jim Crow and all the, you know, all the things that go on. Uh, and from that perspective, uh, the question seems to assume that the analyst is able actually to know how to address racism. You know both consciously or unconsciously within themselves and within the patient, which is probably usually not the case because as, as we're learning, you know, like we're all, we're all getting lessons right now in thinking about our perspectives, how they're bound in the racial group to, to which we've been assigned at birth. You know, mm -hmm. that, that there are certain things that get inculcated in us based on, you know, how, you know, how we're born, <clears throat> to which group we're born in a divided society. So that just was my thought. I just want to go on to some other sort of just uh, this is uh, a comment. The word indifference <clears throat> means to not care in English. Might this be an unconscious expression of a problem in psychoanalysis with love and care for the patients? I want to speak to that, but I just want to add one more thing to the tra uh, trail of comments uh, just a moment ago. Um, I certainly agree with everything you've all said, but to just push us for a moment to deal with the split between the internal and the external that is still so uh, so present in psychoanalytic thinking. The fact is, is that in this country and many others, racism is structural. It's structural, it's historical, it's repetitive, and to to deal with it only with the patient as though it's a it's a personal and historical, in the sense of family, significance misses that point. And it is the structural that we all face and we all live within. We face happily or not, depending on our status and our situation in the world, every day. And the extent to which that, that is not given currency in our, in our psychoanalytic conversations um, uh, alienates many. I mean, Farad uh, Dalal has spoken about the internalist bias in, in psychoanalysis and the, the ways in which uh, people of color, uh, you know, really do not come into treatment with confidence that their real lived experience out in the world will be given adequate attention and respect. And I, I think it's too easy to, to forget that. So just wanted to make that comment. <clears throat> Back to your question, Jack. <laughs> Sorry. Um, here's another comment. So, it was a, so um, here's another comment. In response to the question, are we ever truly neutral? I would suggest that our patients can experience us as neutral because the nature of the analytic relationship is so different from all other relationships. And I say this thinking of what my patients have said to me over the years, and that's the, the, the comment from the, from the, from the audience which makes me think, yes, that, that the patient's experience us is not non-judgmental, you know, and accepting of who they are, which could be, could be uh, defined by the term neutral. That would be my thought on that question. Mm -hmm. uh, here's an interesting one. Um, hi, everyone. Can you give examples of self-disclosures that overpass neutrality boundaries but help the patient a lot? Looking back, do you regret saying that specific self-disclosure? We have a limitation here in our webinar, which is that we, we, we've been asked not to discuss any clinical material in the webinar itself. So as much as I think I would love to have everybody address that question, I have to pass. Um, here's another one. As a candidate, I thought neutrality was important. Now I feel impossible. If the patient came, uh, if the patient came accepted in a racist, anti-Semitic to kill Jews, for example, and looked for a Sephardic amulet to help to make his child a soldier, 
how to be neutral. I wrote a paper on that and presented in Jerusalem 2019. I accepted and they were very grateful. Okay. Another comment. Wouldn't we need to take more into account in our counter transferential reflections the evolution of the analyst identity in the society, which is in a very rapid evolution, culturally, digital era, technical progress? That's an interesting question. Sorry, I, I didn't get the last question, Jack. You said from theoretical to uh, yes, it's about the, the, our own counter transferential reflections as, as we evolve as analyst, our analytic identities in a society which is in very rapid evolution. You know, I guess, how is it? I mean, you know, what, what for example, that comes to mind is, you know, the patients who teach me in my sessions how to use an app to get paid in the session. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, this makes me think also of um, uh, with COVID, most analysts moved from working in person to working remotely and how that impacted our identity and our work also as analysts. And mm -hmm. there's been lots of uh, publications on that uh, issue. It, it's, we're in constant flux and this mm -hmm. is maybe just to be uh, an analyst and in analysis it's a movement it's dynamic it's never static so it's the ability to be open and curious to as you said to learn and, and develop and and discover i have another candidate comment uh as a candidate from a new society where analysts play multiple roles it is very challenging for analysts in training to keep our neutralities. Although this is challenging for analysts in training, I realize that this is also a, a live learning experience within ourselves and others, including our professors. But things can get muddled as it gets with neutrality. How to keep this concept simple is quite complicated. Uh, this is yeah. regarding Patricia's comment about her institute. Yeah, I figure in another institute or associations that are bigger, maybe your analyst is not also your teacher <laughs> at some seminar. So I had that experience. My analyst was my teacher, and so it is difficult to maintain both worlds apart. But also, I think that you can learn from that experience. Well, or that is what I <laughs> tried to do because it was a challenging situation. And but I also think that that's like inevitable. We are in a small society also in the psychological society we still can encounter each other in different activities so maybe we're we have to get used that we're gonna meet each other in different roles but still it is difficult well i was thinking also you can run into your patient in the supermarket or whatever so it's like running into your analyst in the seminar but it's a little bit different because he's also in a role of teacher or professor not only passing by in the street but but still Mm. Maybe this brings <laughs> up the issue of the different models of training. There are different models of training. Mm. The Anglo training, you have to do your analysis while you are training, so you may have that kind of uh, overlapping of roles. But uh, in, in the French model, usually you do your psychoanalysis before mm. you postulate mm. to. Uh, to into training so you think that you may have another um, segment of analysis eventually or a third one but you're expected to have done uh, some time a minimum of two years before you apply as a candidate so it also uh, opens up the dynamics in a different way so it's also the whole analytic experience is very important in its impact on on our stance and role as psychoanalysts, how we've integrated the theory, the the, uh, the training, all of that. There are different models. I, um, we're, we have five minutes left to, to, to this uh, webinar. And um, I, first, I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, unfortunately, we can't hear the applause, I think, of this modality. But here's some applause for your contributions and stimulating this conversation. Uh, I, I 
I, I sat here taking notes on, on the questions that your, your, uh, your comments aroused in the audience. Uh, I think you've created, here's some subjects for our next, for our future webinars that include racism, counter-transference, self-disclosure, boundaries, and dual roles in psychoanalytic training. These are all worthy webinar subjects in and of themselves. So I think this is a very rich, and if, and if anybody has like a, you know, if you, ha you have a one minute wrap up, I think that we'd like to just uh, conclude uh, for our audience, that would be appreciated. Hannah, I'll pick you first. One really? minute, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invite and for the experience. It's been very enriching for me. I've enjoyed very much listening to all of you and I found common points with all of you and, and interesting, it, I mean, you've stimulated my thoughts that I will carry with me for later on and see how that will help me evolve and grow as well. Thank you very much. Patricia. Well, I was, I'm also very grateful of this invitation. It, it, it was an opportunity for me to think about a, a topic that is very like controversial, but also very in the, in the every day of our work. And also I'm glad to have listened to you all and shared these opinions and these thoughts and I was thinking of the richness of this encounter, you know, like we're from three different regions in different countries, we speak different languages, and even though all of that, we can still have common thoughts and think together. Mm -hmm. And I feel that is so like enriching and so analytical in some way. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, I certainly echo um, the comments Hannah, you and Patricia have made. Uh, it's very satisfying to me to find those points of agreement because I, I so often feel like I stand on the uh, defensive side <laughs> of the conversation trying to um, promote a uh, perspective on psychoanalytic practice that has been uh, too long overlooked um, or devalued. And I have to say, uh, today's conversation was wonderfully absent of any of that feeling for me. So it was, it, was, uh, it allowed me to think more openly and, and approach the, uh, the conversation with more of an open heart. I really am glad for this. I hope for follow-ups to it in, in uh, various ways. I think it's a really critical, critical conversation. So thank you. Great. Um, so anyway, I, uh, thank you for such a fruitful and uh, beautiful seminar. I think we have another webinar scheduled for next month, but nobody has told me what the subject is going to be. So, uh, But I think if you've enrolled for this webinar, you will probably get an email or a notification of our, our next ones. So again, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, thank you for the audience. Thank you, our presenters. and. Uh, uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you.